Okay, in five, four, three, two, one, we are live. Hey everybody, what's up? And welcome to the Horns and Stuff podcast where we talk about horns and stuff. This episode is brought to you by Horn.4 Merch. Our instrument is sleek, beautiful, and dare I say, sexy. So I designed a clothing brand that can do the same. No clip art or awful puns, only clean designs and good puns. So make sure you visit the link below and grab your own Horn.4 clothing today. And uh, by using the coupon code, ooh, and by using the coupon code HORNSTUFF, uh, H-O-R-N-S-T-U-F-F, you'll receive 10% off your next order. So go check out Horn.4 merch and uh, I really appreciate that. So welcome to the Horns and Stuff podcast. My name is Patrick, otherwise known as F Horn Patrick on YouTube, and I will be the host today for the Horns and Stuff podcast. Uh, so this episode is going to be a lot of different things. Um, you'll see why in a second, um, because I was asked to d- write an article back in the day. It was about 2015, I believe, um, 2015 or 2016. And I was asked to write an article uh, for the horn publication called Horn Zone, which is on the International Horn Symposium or Society, International Horn Society website. Um, If you haven't checked out this website, it's pretty freaking awesome. Uh, The best thing about this site, there's two two of my favorite things on this site are the... um, The classified section where you can find horns for sale. Uh, I believe, oh crap, are the horns on this site? Yeah, I believe there's horns on this site for sale. So this is where people are selling um, horns that they have. So they're usually used horns. I haven't seen a lot of new horns pop up. But you can find a lot of used horns uh, that are great deals. And I definitely suggest if you're looking for a used horn, you go check out that IHS page. And the second thing that I really love about this website is that they have... um, uh, uh, bad, bad, bad. what are they called <laughs> excerpts so the excerpts are from um like your favorite orchestra pieces and all that stuff they have all the really famous excerpts that you would need to know for auditions and etc uh they're all on the site with recordings from different orchestras from around the world so if you want to play with the orchestra from your city or the city that you're auditioning to you can listen to how they play it and you can play along and learn it the way that they play it so that you're going to audition a lot better so if you haven't checked out the ihs website i definitely suggest that you do that I need to talk slower. I had a, a coffee this morning and I'm flying. So let's let's slow this down. So I was asked to write an article for the Horn Zone, which is on the IHS, IHS website. Um, and this article, uh, I was told I could write anything, I think. Um, again, it was, it was a long time ago. So I wrote an article that I knew I wanted to appeal to a lot of different people. Uh, and the main audience that I wanted to appeal to was younger people, uh, because when I started in the horn world, there wasn't a lot of information for young horn players. A lot of the stuff that I found was, uh, focused around older horn players and people with a lot more experience than I had, or, uh, with a lot more knowledge than I had. So the things that they were talking about, I didn't really, um, understand, I guess you could say, um, so with this article, I wanted to make sure that it could have something for everybody, uh, appealing to younger people first and foremost, but I wanted it to also appeal to older people as well. Anyone who's uh, just kind of wondering what I do and how I do it. Uh, so I just want to show again, uh, what I do and how you can easily learn the skills that I have in order to do those things. Uh, so in this podcast, I'm first going to read the article. Uh, so the article that I wrote on the horn zone. You can check it out uh, in the d- description down below. I'll leave a link to that if you want to reread it or um, read along. <laughs> and uh, so after I read the article, um, I'm just going to kind of break down the sections uh, one by one and talk about each one in depth so that we can uh, have more than a five minute podcast because it'll probably take five or so minutes to talk through the article. Um, yeah. So if you're watching this podcast on YouTube, what's up? Uh, hey, we are live streaming this podcast for the first time. So what is up? Uh, and please leave any questions that you might have in the articles. And I'm going to do my very best to answer your questions. Uh, also, if you're watching, there are, are there are super chat rewards available uh, that you can use for shout outs and making sure that your question is answered. Uh, if you do, a, if you do send a super chat, thank you so much for your support. I really appreciate it. Uh, the super chat definitely helps to fund this channel and more content. Uh, so Leave a super chat and uh, you'll see all the um, 
the rewards down below. Also, if you're watching, you're going to see that I'm looking down at my phone a lot. Um, this is because I need to read what I'm saying because uh, <laughs> uh, it's a long article. I didn't memorize uh, the entire article. So yeah, it's, it's going to be fun. Let's just dive right into the article. So I'm gonna, again, I'm just going to be reading this. So I'm going to be looking down a lot <laughs> uh, and I will break everything down at the end of the article. So I have a lot of stuff to talk about after the article, but we'll just read the article first. Um, and enjoy my writing from 2015. Here we go. <clears throat> As musicians, we are all scared of being creatively boxed in. We all strive to use our original ideas to please not only our audience, but ourselves. With today's technology and an audience eager to hear new things, there are many ways and to improve our musical abilities. By briefly steering away from the textbooks... Oh, by briefly steering away from the textbooks... That's a period. I can read. If you're finding yourself missing notes more often than the person beside you, and those technical books just aren't cutting it, look no further. One key to note accuracy is ear training. <laughs> every instrument, every instrumental musician has a singer inside that needs to be let out in order to be accurate while playing. Practicing simple singing can improve your playing faster than you might think. The more you actively listen to yourself, the more you can learn where the notes will fall. To practice this technique, no fancy studio is required. You also have two you already have two great studios at your disposal. Sing in the shower or in your car. These these two convenient locations allow you to hear yourself so you can recognize where pitches should be. Singing is just like throwing a ball. Without even thinking about it, we can train ourselves to throw a ball at any reasonable distance with variant speeds. Our minds subconsciously think about the distance and speed, do the math, and we throw the ball with amazing accuracy, if you're good at baseball, or if you practice. This same method applies to hitting a correct note. Before we, before we, want, to be able to, before we want to play a note, we must think about it and where it is and how much air it will take to get there. After practicing, just like throwing a ball, our minds will do the math, accurately provide us with the pitch and air support required for any given note. When we are all young musicians, we face performance anxiety. This, annoy, uh, this annoying physiological function can turn our hours in the practice room into, sh into a shaky mess during the performance. The unfortunate thing about this anxiety is that we all have to find out what works for us and as individuals to reduce stress. The most simple fixes are cutting down on caffeine. I should have done that before doing this podcast. Eating larger amounts of potassium and doing basic meditative exercises to help Re relieve some stress however one of the best fixes for performance anxiety is confidence going into a concert completely prepared can get greatly improve your attitude when you're sitting in front of the music on stage this confidence requires time also get familiar with the music you have to practice practicing doesn't have to be sitting down in your music with a metronome ticking away in a tuner telling you that you're off practicing the music can be as simple as listening to the piece and singing along with your part in hand once your ear knows the piece, you have to learn the fingerings and sing through the horn. Once you master confidence in your abilities, the rest will follow. We all want to be a better musician. There is always someone we wish we could sound like. To better yourself musically, you will have to pick up your horn and play. You can play whatever you want, however you want, as long as you are playing. The more styles of music you can play, the better musician you can be. If we get stuck in our own specific genre for too long, we begin to dislike our sound or style in our music. Branching out to total opposite genres can inspire new sounds and techniques to apply to our own specific style of music. One very useful way to give yourself a reason to pick up your instrument is a technique called looping. Looping involves a computer software that, re that replays a set number of bars so that you can layer sounds on top to create new music without having to leave your basement. To get into looping, all you need is a simple mic and a basic looping software you can find anywhere online. When you loop, you can build up a simple chord progression for a song. Once this structure is set, you can do anything you want to it. The most common thing to do... I, can't, I keep getting notifications, sorry. The most common thing to do um, would be improvise over it. Improvising always... Improvising allows you to play whatever your note, your heart desires. The best part about improvising with yourself and a machine is that you will never be wrong. Improvising is your own mind exploring its creativity, and unlike your gra grade school art class, there are no wrong answers. To name an example, if you had a chord progression that lasted 8 bars, 
You could hold one note for those eight bars just so you can hear how that note sounds with the chords you layer out. This technique allows your mind to relate two pitches and hear what is pleasing and displeasing. Being a young musician today allows us to do what we want in terms of exploring creativity. We live in an arts world these days where we have platforms built for our own unique expressions of sound. The technology of our generation has given us a gift to explore our individuality. We just had to find something unique in it ourselves and explore it. The only way to explore these sounds is to pick up your horn and play. <laughs> so that was me reading for five minutes. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that because I didn't. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm regretting the coffee before this. Let me tell you that much. So what do we think of the article? <laughs> um, if you understood anything of what I read it, was reading, what did you think? Um, did you find anything useful in it? Did you kind of understand what I was going for there? Um, let me know in the, in the super chat. Let me see uh, what you guys think. So I wrote this article while I was still in school. Uh, so I was still learning myself, but everything is true to what I'm, what I did coming up as a horn player. So everything that I talked about in the article was a major part of how I progressed as a horn player without a teacher, uh, through high school and so on. Um, so coming up as a horn player, I was really independent. Um, and practicing, I, I had to learn different ways to improve myself because your high school teacher has 60 to hundred other students that they need to teach. So it's really hard to get specific skills. I mean, that's what I found in universe or in high school. Uh, so they give you those, the major fundamentals, but you kind of have to learn on your own. And that's the best part about learning an instrument in high school. So developing, developing those tricks and skills is what, uh, really worked for me. Uh, the first benefit that I found and that I talked about in the article was ear training. Um, I found that ear training was one of the most important parts about being able to play the horn. So it's something that I really wanted to develop because I knew I needed it. And I knew that uh, the better I was at ear training, the better I would be at horn. Uh, so if you're in high school already or if you're in university, you should have done this before. Uh, you do ear training exercises. Um, and this is when the teacher or professor will play um two notes, uh, either like one after the other, one after the other, or at the same time. And you have to name, uh, the interval that that is. So for example, like seconds, thirds, fourths, they'll play that on a piano and you write down that that's a fourth. Uh, if it wasn't a fourth and you get it wrong, you know, that that's kind of how that goes. Um, and I was always good at these, um, these, these tests. Um, and I think it was because that I developed a certain trick for each interval that really helped me learn what the intervals were. Um, and I found that a lot of students that I went to high school with didn't do the same thing and they were struggling with finding the interval because they were just trying to be a genius when you really just needed to learn a specific trick. So what I did um, to learn these tricks is I gave each interval kind of a, um, like a, not a name, but I would relate it to a song or sound that I heard before. And then I would just instantly know that that was the interval. So let's say a third, um, if you play, if you play the third in your head backwards. So if they play the third on the piano and then you just think of the notes, um, in the reverse order, it's a doorbell like the ding dong. That's a third. Um, the fifths are the beginning to the Forrest Gump theme song. Um, if you know what I'm talking about, go play it on the piano and you'll hear it too. Um, the a sixth interval um, is the beginning of like a train door opening and so on. Like all of these intervals, I gave them their own little trick and tactic so that when I heard it on the piano, I would just know what it was based on um, the sound that I related it to. Um, so I thought of the ways to recall the intervals so that I didn't have to question it. Um, and as soon as I heard it, I knew it instantly. So you can develop these tricks uh, by sitting down at a piano and seeing what you can come up with for each interval. Uh, the intervals that I just mentioned, they might not work for you. Um, but if you sit down at a piano and play a second, um, I never had a trick for a second because they're so close that I just always knew it was a second. Um, so I don't have a trick for a second, but if you go down and play a third, you can think of your own trick for a third and then a fourth. Um, the fourth is the wedding, like the da 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 da, yeah is the wedding interval. So there's just intervals for every single one. Um, I can never think of a seventh. The seventh was always my, my crutch, but I had tricks for every single one. So if I didn't hear one of those, it was a seventh. That was kind of my, my trick. Um, 
Yeah, so just develop your own. If you're having trouble with intervals in class, I don't know if your teachers are telling you telling you not to do this, then don't do it. I don't know why they would though, because if you know the interval, it doesn't matter what you do, I think. Um, so I found that intervals in ear training are super important for the French horn, our instrument, um, as it is played with our ears, um, in my opinion. If you've ever played a trumpet, you'll know that the notes sit in slots. Um, so the slots that are in between each note. So when you play the C and you just kind of lip up to the next note, there's these huge slots, um, for the notes that are really easy to find. But if you play horn, you will know that these instruments are really hard to find because they're not far away at all. They're really close. When you play like an F and a G on the horn, uh, you'll see that those notes sit really, really close together and it makes it really hard to play them because they, they feel the same. So if you don't know how they should sound, um, it'll be really hard to play. So having a good ear will make your job as a horn player a lot easier. Uh, being able to sing the note before you play will also make it a lot easier. And this is to do with uh, ear training too, because you sing by hearing. I think it's hard to sing without being able to hear it. There's definitely people who do that um, on a day-to-day if you're deaf or something like that. But being able to sing makes your job a lot easier easier um so you can practice this um by you so the trick to being able to sing in ear training is um uh if you can sing the note before you play it it will instantly make things easier uh so you can practice this by singing notes and bringing the horn to your face and then playing the note so you just kind of like a hum and f like hmm and then bring the horn to your face with like the first finger down and then play an f right away And if it's wrong, then you adjust and you do it again until you can get it right every time with every note. Um, So this is a really good way to exercise doing that so that you know the first note, like say you are playing, like you're the opening sound of a piece and you're like, I really hope that this is the right note because I'm really exposed. I'm really scared. Like, uh, well, say like the Chegg 5 solo, uh, like the banana, I'm not a singer, Um, but... (laughs) You, like that, uh, you come out of nowhere as super quiet, super like super ominous. And then you're going to come in with this beautiful A. It's going to be so nice. But if you're hearing the wrong pitch in your head and you're not singing it in your head, or you can even hum it really quietly. If you're not hearing the right one and you come in and it's the wrong note, it's going to sound really bad. So if you sing it ahead of time in your head before you play it, it just makes it so that there's no like question that's going to be the wrong note because you are, you're singing it. You know it's the right note. It feels right. sounds right. It's going to be right. So singing it really helps. Um, and this can be turned into a game if you're practicing or teaching um, for younger students. Uh, so, you again, you sing the note and then sing, 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 bring the horn to your face and play the note. Um, it's a really good technique to learn so that uh, it takes out a lot of the question of, oh, I hope this is the right note because it's going to be really embarrassing if it's not the right note. Uh, So in the article, I mentioned singing in the shower or in the car. Um, And I really mean that. Um, If you put on Strauss 1 in the car um, and belt out the whole thing along with Dennis Brain, I promise you the next time you play it, it will be a lot easier. So put on that favorite recording of Strauss 1 and the whole time, just sing along to it. Sing the horn part um, with all the fun articulations. Have fun with it. You You can make up your own things and stuff like that. And I promise you the next time you play... Um, that on the horn, it's going to be a lot different because you, you've you sung the whole thing, you know the whole thing in your head. So it's going to make the whole thing a lot easier because it leaves little question as you can already sing the whole piece. Uh, you already know it all in your head. So singing really helps because it just builds up those those neuron relations or something something smart like that in your head so that there's not as much question when you go to play it. You're not like, oh, I wonder what this is going to sound like. You already know what the piece should sound like, so you just have to do it. You already know what what you want it to sound like, so you just have to push it through the horn, and and everything just just falls into place after that. Uh, so the next section in the article I talk about is performance anxiety. Fun uh, performance anxiety is a big part of what we do, and it is a really annoying thing because it's something we all have to face, and it becomes really tough to play. Uh, I've always had trouble with performance anxiety, and that's why I've tried to develop a lot of different techniques and tricks to use for different situations uh, in order to not get performance anxiety, because I hate it. I hate performance anxiety. It sucks. You practice so much, 
and then it just comes out of nowhere. It really stinks. So the simple trick that I talk about that can help you with performance anxiety. Um, so I talk, oh, here we go. Let's, let's read that again. So I talk about simple tricks that can help you with performance anxiety. But the biggest trick I found um, to have confidence is, uh, um, is to ha- I can't read today, okay? Well, I'm going to blame the coffee. Anyways, <laughs> the biggest trick that I found is to have confidence. And confidence is what really shuts down performance anxiety. So in the article, I talk about um, not having coffee. Again, shouldn't have coffee um, or caffeine, that kind of thing. Um, so you don't get performance anxiety. Um, but the biggest the trick that I found to not have performance anxiety is confidence. So the reason confidence is so important is that because when you have confidence, it really diminishes that stress that you're going to have about missing notes as we already have the confidence about the piece that you're going to play. So to gain that confidence, again, it just has to do with practicing. If you practice your piece to a point where you know exactly what you need to do, you know exactly how it sounds, you've sung it a million times, you know what you're going to do and you know what you're going to feel like, there's no there shouldn't be any anxiety uh, based around unknowns because there's nothing unknown. You know that piece backwards and forwards. You, you can do it with your eyes closed. You can sing it and you can do everything. There shouldn't be any worry about what's going to happen according to the piece because you know it so well. So building up that confidence is super important. Um, so again, all the notes that you have to play, you you know all the notes that you have to play. Um, which, which gets rid of, um, what you need to worry about because you know, everything that's going to happen Um reading what I've, what I've written on this is really tricky because I voiced out a lot of this. So it doesn't make sense. <laughs> um, so I'm going to do a whole podcast on performance anxiety. So we'll just leave, uh, this section kind of short, uh, just so we can get to the other meat and potatoes of this podcast. We'll definitely talk about performance anxiety a lot because I think it's a major part of playing any instrument. Um, and it's something that we all have to work through and we all have different techniques in dealing with performance anxiety. So I think that when I have, um, other guests onto the podcast, we will definitely talk about performance anxiety in depth with them. Uh, professionals who play with really big orchestras will have a lot to say about performance anxiety. So we will look forward to that. So the title of this article is pick up your horn and play. And I think that's the biggest lesson that I try to teach, um, every day when I try to teach, Horn, um, this is the lesson that I try to teach. Um, So as we move down the article, I talk about this practice, which is picking up your horn and playing. Uh, Learning horn, I always brought my horn home so that I could sneak in more practicing. So when I was in high school, I mentioned in the first podcast that I'd always bring my horn home because I just wanted to play more. Um, I just really enjoyed playing, and I just knew that if I took it home, um, I would be one step ahead of people who were not bringing home. Um, so this practicing, a quote unquote practicing was basically just me messing around on my horn and playing things that I liked. Uh, so a lot of the time I didn't have sheet music because we weren't allowed to bring home the sheet music for our school unless we had photocopied versions. So a lot of the times I didn't bring home any music. So it was just me playing horn and just experimenting with the different things you could do with the horn. Um, horn was a big unknown to me. Uh, there wasn't a lot online that could show you what you could do with it. So it was uh, it was me experimenting with what I kind of wanted to do with it. And I found that the more I played, uh, the better my chops would feel the next day. So um, I'd be playing a lot and it felt really good that day. And then you rest, you go to the school the next day and you're like, wow, my lips feel great. I, I did so much work yesterday and now they just feel stronger and better. And I just, I'm just hitting all the notes, right. And all this and that, but I didn't practice any pieces. I don't know what I did. And that's just, you, you just, you, you, you just, (laughs) you, you practiced horn a lot more, which means that no matter what you were hearing the notes and you're doing the fingerings, right? So your brain is just, is just better at the horn. So our lips and muscles, uh, and, and this is why that happens. It's because our lips and muscles need to be exercised in order to get better. And picking up your horn and playing as much as possible is what will get you to a better place in your performance. So thinking of this practicing that I was talking about as uh, like horn cardio, where it's just like working out 30 minutes a day will make a world of difference. So 30 minutes of doing anything on the horn, as long as like, remember, keep in mind, you need to have your, your fundamentals still at practice. So don't have bad embouchure. Don't have bad posture, kind of keep your hand in the right spot. 
um, and then just kind of have fun. And that'll be 30 minutes of practice more than you, someone else might've done, even though you didn't practice anything on the page, you were just playing along with like a piece on the radio or you're just kind of doing scales like that kind of thing. And it's just playing the horn, playing anything on the horn is better than playing nothing on the horn, in my opinion. So the most fun way that I found to do this horn cardio uh, was by looping, uh, something that you guys seem to really enjoy from my YouTube channel. Uh, So I discovered looping from a fellow on YouTube named Chris Bill on YouTube. Uh, If you don't know Chris Bill, uh, make sure you check him out on YouTube. He is a trombone player and he posts every Saturday and it's always amazing new stuff. Uh, He does, I can't, he still does some loops, but he has a lot of arrangements that I don't know how he puts them together so fast and they're just so great. Um, but definitely go check him out on YouTube if you haven't. He plays trombone, so we won't judge too hard. But um, if you like a good brass musician, he's definitely someone you should check out because he's just doing incredible work, and he's always been doing incredible work. And he does a lot with students and stuff, like education-wise. So if you want to hear tips and tricks about the brass world, definitely check out Chris. Uh, he does a lot of great stuff. Uh, so I found Chris while I was in high school, and I didn't know how to do what he was doing loop-wise until I was in university. Um, it just seemed really um, hard because the only way I knew how to loop was to buy a $300 pedal that could only loop like one track over and over again. That would be really hard. If you messed up like the middle track, you already did two clean ones. If you messed up the middle one, it just seemed like it was impossible to fix it and that kind of stuff. So looping just felt like it was out of the question until I was in university. Um, and when I found this found out how to do looping without this pedal and with to make it a lot easier so you didn't have to stress it was a great great day um so i found this looping function in garage band uh if you have a mac or an iphone you should know or have heard of garage band if you have a pc or um android phone there are similar apps to garage band you just have to look up um garage band alternatives and you'll find some i'm on pc now so i i feel you i don't have garage band anymore but Um, All of this still applies to PC. You just have to kind of find out the specifics to the app that you downloaded. So you can get GarageBand on your Mac and iPhone. So it should be accessible by most of us uh, since cell phones are so like prominent nowadays. Uh, If you have an iPhone, uh, they make GarageBand for iPhone and the looping function is there. Uh, So you can also find functions on most free recording software if you don't have a Mac. So the way I started with looping was I would record a chord progression on GarageBand and just set it to an unlimited loop. So I would record loops, um, and I'll get into how to um, record your own loops in a second. I'm just kind of setting it up here. Um, So I would record these loops, and then I would just kind of noodle around with it. Um, I'd set like a a jazzy kind of um, loop, and then I would just solo, and literally hours would go by. Um, practicing and doing solo techniques and that just built up a confidence in soloing and just playing in general because I knew where notes should go and I knew how um, notes should be in relation to where they were when I was playing and this just like excessive amount of practicing while looping just built my chops up so that they're super strong I was doing these loops uh, and I started doing them for YouTube and stuff and the, the loops were just getting super long um, and it took me so like some of the loops on YouTube would take me eight hours to record, uh, because they were so complicated and just would to get it right. It took about eight hours, um, sometimes, and that's eight hours of playing, which, um, if you ever have tried to sit down and practice for eight hours, you will know that it is next to impossible. Um, I find that I have like a 45 minute practicing, um, sheet music deadline like it takes like after 45 minutes my brain's tired so i have to take a couple hour break in between but with looping i found that it was just fun and kind of turned my brain off so i could loop for hours on end and it was just an amazing time uh so i would just noodle around and it was great um it just yeah (laughs) so let's get into how you can loop uh and i'm just gonna talk about garage band because i i think most people have max uh, most people who are artist type people by Max, I think, don't come after me. I have a PC. I'm a PC guy now. Um, but I'm just going to do GarageBand because it's how I started and I think it's the most accessible program. Um, if you're trying to get into it, GarageBand is definitely the easiest recording program to get into. It's super simple. The user interface is great. 
So if you want to start out in recording anything, I would definitely head over to GarageBand. Um, so the first thing you need to do in order to record a loop is um, open GarageBand. That's step one, create a file. Um, and then you can either go into um, the sound profiles and there'll be a French horn, or you can just leave it regular and kind of add the effects that you want. The horn one's pretty good. I think it adds a bit too much reverb, but you can turn it down. It's all good. It's, it's super simple to do that. So the first, so after that, so I guess this would be the second thing is to um, then record, once you figure out how to record a section, this is going to be like, you, you already know how to use GarageBand. That's the assumption that I'm going with. Uh, so you're going to record a section in GarageBand um, that you want to loop. So I usually start with the bass part. Um, so if you have a chord progression, start with the bottom note and then just play the bottom notes of each chord and then stop. Uh, it really helps to put on a metronome for this. Um, in GarageBand, there's a metronome that you'll hear in your ears. Oh, and make sure you're wearing a headphone. You need to wear headphones because if you're not wearing a headphone and it'll start recording what your monitor is hearing. So wear headphones. Uh, and then so the, the metronome, it will only be in your monitor or headphones. So it will not be recorded into the track itself. And a metronome will help keep everything perfectly in time as long as you can play with the metronome. And I think that is key, that, that is key. Um, when recording these loops because everything has to be in time. Uh, so the next thing you'll want to do with that recorded section that you just had is go to the top right of the um, recorded section. And you'll see a little looping switch. It's like a, like an arrow in a circle. And you want to click that and you're going to drag it as far as you want. You can drag that sucker to the end of time and it will just loop and loop and loop and loop and loop, and loop forever. It's crazy. Um, it's super simple. Um, make sure, oh, the trick with that. So your recorded section though, let's say it's going to be four bars long. Make sure you end your chord progression at the end of that fourth bar. And it's going to record a little bit because you have to stop and just trim it to the end of that fourth bar and then pull it over to loop it. That way every four bars you have a new looped section over and over and over again. Super simple. And now you have a loop till the end of time. Um, in my notes it says, and boom, you've created a loop. Hoorah. <laughs> So the next thing you want to do is you can record as many of these loops as you want. You can stack them. You can make a chord super complicated. I'm not a complicated guy, so my loops were never super complicated. Um, but you can make you can do whatever you want. If you're a jazz musician, you can make some super jazzy stuff. If you just want to record um, just a four bar, um, one, four, five, four, five, one chord progression. I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> you can do that. So you can record whatever you want. Um, and then you can make your textures super thick. And then this is the basic principle that I would use to make any loop. Um, and once I, once I would lay down the tracks and then just record them or, or sorry, I'm skipping ahead, skipping ahead. So this is the basic thing that I would use to, um, like solo over. So I would create like a little thing and then I just improvise over it. And I thought like improvising was the most fun thing ever. Um, in the in the jazz band class that I took, I played Barry Sax. Again, don't come at me. I loved Barry Sax. It was so much fun. I got to play in jazz band because we had too many trombones, so I didn't get to play horn on trombone or trombone on horn. Uh, but I played Barry Sax, and that was really fun. Um, and I was really good at improvising because I played so much soloing stuff in Garage Band at my house. So I, I was just always great at improvising because I just did it a lot. Um, so it's useful. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm teaching some good stuff here. <laughs> so this is the, this is the basic trick that I would use to practice looping. Uh, the stuff that I just talked about, that's the next note I had after the, the boom comment. Um, so I found that when you would create, I, or sorry, I then found that you could create whole songs by looping. So when you're listening to those top 40 songs, um, and they sound pretty similar throughout the song, um, that's what makes a good loop. Uh, so if you guys are suggesting that I do certain songs for loops and I just don't do them, it's because you can't loop them because they're not simple enough. They're a little complicated. Well, the more complicated the song is, the more loops you have to create. And then it ends up being like an eight minute video where I'm just building the loop instead of it just happening. But like the simpler the song, the easier it is for it to loop. So for those, I would just lay down the tracks and record them uh, one by one live to create these live loops that you probably found me from. 
Um, so it was really easy to build. So the way I do it for like the live looping videos is I would build up the chord progression first. And then once everything's all built up and ready to go, I, I stop every, all the tracks and then I play like the intro thing and then all the tracks kick in, do the chorus, all that fun stuff. And then we have the really great loop video. Um, or it's like crazy frog and you, you do it in a weird way. And then for some reason it gets 32 million views. I don't understand. But if you can figure out how to loop crazy frog, apparently you're going to do well in this world. <laughs> so get like, so from everything I like everyone, I, I've been asked this question of how to loop forever. Um, I've just kind of not ignored them. I just wanted to do it in a long form podcast, kind of like this, where I could really get into, um, get into it because it's, it's not that complicated, but it does take a while to figure out. So the trick is to just practice, um, it's not going to come to you overnight. It takes a really long time to get good at recording yourself. Um, and I think listening to yourself recorded is hugely beneficial. Not sure if that's good grammar or not, but it's really beneficial to listen to yourself play horn because you're going to hear all those mistakes. Um, you're going to get to know yourself really well through this process. You're going to hear all the good, bad and ugly that you produce and that's okay. Um, it really helps to hear those things. Um, I've always found that to be the case to just, the more you listen to yourself, the better you're going to get. So th this looping will also get you into that and it's going to build up your ear, um, building all these loop pedals, uh, loop things. So just, I did them all by ear and then I'd write them down after. Um, so all of this really ties together into one happy, um, how to become a form Patrick video. Um, and then the other benefit, the last benefit that I found to making these loops, as I mentioned, it would take me eight hours to film some of these is it built up a huge stamina for practicing. Um, that I would never be able to do if I was just playing off of sheet music because that's just a snore fest after about 45 minutes for me. A lot of you can probably do play sheet music for hours and hours, but I find that um, when just playing the horn and having fun, I can go for an endless amount of time. Um, and that's something that I had over a lot of other people is that I was just playing horn for an immense amount of time uh, because it allowed me to focus in and just play um, and just not worry about a lot of things that you would worry about when you're practicing sheet music because you're just making a lot of it up. So that being said, um, this isn't, shouldn't be the only thing that you practice. Um, eight hours of looping a day will not um, satisfy your teachers, I'm sure. Uh, so you're going to want to practice all your other stuff. Make sure you're warming up properly. Yeah, if you're playing for, if you're getting into this thing and you're playing for a long time, make sure you warm up and warm down. Uh, don't forget about the benefits of warming down. So that's just playing long tones at the end. I do really low long tones to warm down. Um, and that really helps. Uh, but after that, just have fun. Um, the, this is, this is the podcast of how to have fun. And I think that, um, it's really beneficial to just enjoy what you're doing. And that's why I got into looping because it just meant that I could enjoy what I was doing the whole time without worrying about, um, sheet music and that kind of stuff. So if you add this to your practice, even if you're not adding looping, just play along to the radio. Um, it, it, practicing isn't about like, if you're trying to build up stamina, it's definitely about quantity over quality. I think, um, you want to just play a lot. And the trick to that is to just play a lot. So you're going to have to find something you enjoy doing it. Um, so the overall key to success is time and energy. And if you're putting in more time, building up skills that other might, uh, others might not have, you'll be ahead of the curve. Not sure why I wrote that, but you got to listen to it. So I hope you enjoyed. This is Horns and Stuff, the podcast that we talk about horns and stuff. <laughs> so, so everything takes time. Um, if you're trying to get into looping, just remember, I didn't learn it overnight. It took a lot of practice. If you go back and listen to the first uh, loop that I ever made, it's not that great. Uh, so, And it was a direct copy of Chris Bills. Like I literally copied the whole thing. Um, and I still sometimes think of that and laugh that I just copied his, um, but he's so nice. And it was my first one I was learning. So sorry, Chris, if you're listening. And the last thing I have written down in this note section is to, uh, just pick up your horn and play. Um, that's the basic, uh, theme that I try to say with this uh, podcast is just pick up your horn and play because I think it's really beneficial to just have fun with the horn. It's a great instrument and the more you play it, the better you're gonna get at it. Um, it's really hard to remember all these fingers and what to do with the notes. So if you're just picking up and playing, you're building up those uh, those neurons or something smart people would say. 
so uh let's let's see chat do we do we enjoy this podcast uh did we learn a lot um if you're listening to this podcast thank you so much um i really appreciate it if you're watching it hello what is up uh what would you like to see in the next podcast you can leave reviews if you're listening to this on like apple podcast you can leave a review and and let me know what you want to th- want to hear next or you could go on to my instagram and let me know what you'd like to hear next or you can leave it in the chat uh what you guys would like to hear next um i have a lot of things that i would like to talk about and a lot of people that i would like to t- like to talk to uh, but I would love to know what specifically you guys would like to hear, uh, so that this podcast is a conversation between you and me and not just, um, me rambling and, and not talking properly for 40 ish minutes at a time. Uh, do you have any guests that you guys would like to, to hear on the podcast? Um, I definitely have a few that I would love to have on the podcast. Some live far away, so it's, it's not easy. Actually, most people live far away, so it's not an easy thing, but let me know who you'd like to hear and we'll try to see what we can do about getting those people on the podcast. Um, this podcast is going to be huge. No, I, <laughs> it's going to, yeah. So let me know. And, and yeah. Okay. So, uh, again, this podcast airs live every Monday and Thursday. Uh, so if you want to check in Monday and Thursday, I think I set it to 2 PM. If that doesn't work, uh, we can always change it, but the podcast does go live on iTunes or anywhere podcasts are available before it goes live, uh, or sorry, after it goes live, I could not be before. Um, so if you want to hear it, sorry, I'm yawning. this podcast is so exciting. <laughs> so if you want to hear it, you can hear it anywhere. Uh, if you want to watch it, it's here on YouTube and I'm going to be posting it on Facebook. I think I'll make it live on Facebook as well. Uh, cause you can do both. Um, and remember that this horn podcast horns and stuff podcast so the podcast where we talk about horns and stuff is brought to you by horn.4 merch. Uh, again, if you want to go get 10% off your next horns and stuff order or not horns and stuff order horn.4 merch order, uh, just do the coupon code horn stuff, which is H O R N S T U F F horn stuff uh, for 10% off your next order. I really appreciate you guys uh, getting that merch. I think it's, I really like to wear it. I'm, I wear it most days. I think I'm wearing it today under this shirt. I can't remember. Um, I wear this, as you noticed, I, I am a very simple guy and I like to wear the same thing every day. So I have lots of them. So I buy lots of horn dot four merch. Um, oh, and some, uh, someone was asking what the horn dot four merch meant. Like what's this horn dot four mean? So horn, obviously it's, it's the horn. We like to horn the dot four is because there's always four horns in a section. So I added the horn dot four cause it's usually four horns in a section, sometimes eight. Uh, but I just thought four and horn just is uh they go they go hand in hand so again chat what's up hey hello how are you um listeners on apple podcast what's up uh you guys are the dominating podcast so far uh spotify is closely behind and then after that is anchor um so again thank you for watching the horns and stuff podcast where i talk about horns and stuff and i will see you in the next one see you later guys